Hey folks, so um, as I said, I just wanted to go over a couple more practice exercises before the final exam. Um, so what I wanted to do, I've got the Hurley chapter here that I sent out on Blackboard. Uh, this is from the uh, Hurley's textbook, A Concise Intro Introduction to Logic. It's a very, very good book, but as you can tell, the chapter is rather long. Uh, you're certainly not required to read it. But as I, re as I recommended, um, if you are stuck on any particular rules, uh, like disjunctive syllogism, it gives you more examples, it gives you a couple other proofs that you can study that use that rule. So, you know, so I'd use it as a resource if you need it. Um, at the end of each section, you'll see that there's these strategies listed. These are these can be quite useful, so I, I would work, recommend reviewing these. You certainly don't have to memorize them or anything. But um, if you, yeah, if you have time, I would say uh, take a look at these and see if they help you when you're thinking about the proofs. Okay, so um, these are all the rules that we've covered course, rules of implication and rules of replacement. I won't go through it all. I figured I would just uh, get some practice. So um, I haven't looked at these proofs before. I'm going to go straight to the end, end of the chapter, where we have covered all the rules. And I figure we'll just go through the first five uh, proofs. As I said, I haven't looked at these before. So you might see me get stuck. You might see the solution even before I do. Um, that's fine. Um, as I said, hopefully the, um, you know, thinking through the problem would be helpful on its own. So let's just get started. So let's look at proof one. All right, so we start with the first premise. Um, as I mentioned in this text, they use the dot here. This dot is used uh, as a conjunction, so I'm using ampersand. S and K implies R. They use the horseshoe, as it's called, uh, instead of an arrow sign, so no difference there really, but uh, this is the notation I'll use. Okay, so S and K implies R, second premise, K, and I'm trying to get to S implies R. Um, one thing I'll mention, uh, let's see, yeah, one thing I'll mention right off the bat is like probably the most elegant solution to this proof would be to use conditional proof. For instance, okay, wait, this is a premise. This is a premise. So, uh, as I said, conditional proof and indirect proof will not be required for the exam. But let me just illustrate how this would look. I could, for instance, assume S. Uh, then, of course, I can get S and K from conjunction. And then I have S and K, and I have that here. So I can apply modus ponens to derive R. Uh, sorry, conjunction lines two and three, modus ponens lines one and four, and now I've gotten to R and I've assumed S, so I've shown that if you assume S, if S, then you can infer R, then R, and that would be, you know, conditional proof, uh, like three, five. Okay, so that's just, uh, that actually is probably the quickest way to solve this, but um, not required. So let's see if we can find another path. So we're not allowed to make this assumption here, so we gotta get rid of that. All right, so what are we looking at here? I mean, what can we do? Well, we've got, we can't apply simplification because remember simplification is a rule of, impl is a rule of implication, so it does not apply to subformulas. So we can't apply it here. We could try addition, perhaps, something like that. But we're dealing with a conditional, and we don't seem to be able to do anything with it. So, you know, conditional, like, this seems like this is must be an important statement. 
but at the moment we're not really able to do much with it so we might want to convert it to a disjunction right with the rule of material implication I can negate the left hand side which is s and k so it would be not s and k implies uh, sorry or r and that would be material implication on one and two no uh, sorry just one just uh, one okay so let's see what's going on here now I've got a negation which is kind of distributed over a conjunction or is operating on a conjunction and I've got a disjunction here so two things come to mind one would be to apply the dis, uh, distribution right to distribute R across not S and K the other thing that occurs to me would be to apply De Morgan's law okay remember De Morgan's law is a rule of replacement so you can apply it to subformulas so let's go ahead and try that so with De Morgan's law it's kind of like spreading a negation or distributing a negation um, but what you have to do is you negate both sides and you turn and to or so and becomes or or if you started with or it become and but in this case and becomes or or not k alright so not s or not k is equivalent to not s and k so I've done uh, you know a replacement there using uh, material implication and then the rest of the formula stays the same okay so that's material implication uh, I'm sorry that's De Morgan's law on three okay so now let's think now what's going on we've just got these two disjunctions in a row right um, so how are we going to get here so let's look at where we're trying to get to right if we had if we had not s or r then we could um, use material implication to convert that to s implies r so here we have not s or not k or r okay interesting so what can we do we haven't used this uh, part of it at all right okay so as I said here the goal is s implies r if we had not s or r so if we had sorry if we had not s or r then we could use material implication to turn that into s implies r so that would be reaching the goal so I'm kinda of thinking backwards now so now I want to get to not s or r and here I've got like a two-way dis disjunction or a three-way disjunction or whatever not s not k and r and I can see that k here is going to kind of be able to you know knock this one out so I should just be left with not s or r but in order to do that I'll have to apply disjunctive syllogism and I can't apply disjunctive syllogism um, to this subformula right um, because it is a rule of a replacement if I am not mistaken yes it is a uh, sorry is a rule of implication it is a rule of implication so I cannot apply it to subformulas okay so I just have to do a little bit of rearranging first before I can do that so I want to get K on its own okay so first let me switch these around okay so I'm just switching not K and not S I'm moving them around remember that's called commutativity 
So we can do commutativity on 4. Now I've got not k or not s or r. And remember, when you have two of the same operator in a row, what can you do? You can apply associativity. So I can actually, you know, right now these are associated, but I can change it so that these are associated. So it would look like this. Uh, associativity on 5. Okay, see that? So basically I'm just moving the parentheses. Because I have two disjunctions in a row, then I'm allowed to apply associativity. So I move the parentheses so that k is by itself. And now look, now I have a disjunction. One side is not k. And up here I've got k. So that means I can knock off you know, the left-hand side using disjunctive syllogism. And what I'd be left with is not S or R using disjunctive syllogism on 2 and 6. Okay, you see that? So I've got this disjunction here and I've got the negation of the left-hand side so I can uh, just infer the right-hand side. And now, that's just what I was saying, this is what we want not s or r, I can turn into s implies r. And that would be material implication on 7. So let me return to the proof. And there we go, s implies r. Okay, so, um, you know, I would say that this is, you know, this is towards the end of the chapter. These are fairly difficult proofs. I mean, this one was kind of hard, at least I think it's kind of hard to, to to work through, even though we're not using like super complicated rules. Um, the, the chain of reasoning isn't obvious, I'll say. Uh, at least I would say so. So hopefully you follow along with that. Um, let's move on to the next proof. Okay, proof two. G implies E, and H implies not E, and we're trying to get to G implies not H. So first premise, G implies E, second premise, H implies not E. Ah, okay, oh boy, what are we going to do? So at this point, right, we can't we can't apply hypothetical syllogism because we don't have a match between this. We can't apply modus tollens. That doesn't really make sense. So what can we do? Uh, well, all I can think of is really to turn these into disjunctions. That seems to be um, at least a natural first step. Maybe that'll turn out to be the wrong move. But how else are we going to do this? Ah, actually, I have a better idea. Um, recall the rule of hypothetical syllogism tells you that when you have two conditionals, where you have like the right-hand side matching the left-hand side of another, you can kind of chain them together. That's not the case here. But here we have E, and here we have not E. And if you recall, there's this rule that says you can go from P implies Q to not Q implies not P. You can switch them around and negate them both. Okay, so I can turn H implies not E. I'll do it kind of the, the long way, if you like, the precise, more, slightly more strict way, but... Um, so I negate the right-hand side, I get not not E, and I negate the left-hand side, and I get not H. And that's called um, contrapositive, but I think we call it transposition in the text. Uh, it's, it's often called contrapositive. In any case, okay. 
So now we've got that. Now let's just get rid of this double negation because that was just a bit of a extra step. Double negation on three. Transposition on two. Okay, so, so everyone catch that? So we had basically this conditional. You flip it around and you negate both sides. Now I've got G going to E and E going to not H. So I have the same thing on the right hand side here as the left hand side here, which means I can sort of connect them, right, in that chain kind of way. So I get G implies not H. Hypothetical syllogism, one, four, and that's what we're trying to prove. So there you go. So my initial thought was uh, to go with material invocation because uh, you know I didn't quite see the connection here, but um, there's yeah you have to keep in mind all the different rules that can apply when you're dealing with conditional, and um, this is a very useful one to be able to flip the arguments around in this way. Okay, right. So just to wrap up, we flip these flip each argument to the other side, negate both sides, that's transposition, then we just do apply double negation to get rid of this junk, and then finally that allowed us to um, chain these together using hypothetical syllogism. Okay? Cool. Alright, we're moving pretty good. So again, um, that's maybe a medium, medium difficulty proof I would say. Um, yeah, actually it's quite short, um, but it, it uh, requires a little bit of cleverness, so. All right, number three. First premise, not N or P. Second premise, N implies P implies T. All right, so this one I'm starting to feel like is on the easier side. Yeah, so I kind of see where this is going, okay? So we're, we're going to T. So again, if you, if you um, have the time, pause the video, see if you can figure out how to solve this to get to T. I would say this looks to be a pretty low difficulty proof. So uh, what rule is coming up again and again? As I said, it's quite useful, material implication. Right, we're trying to get to T. So let's think backwards. We're trying to get here. So if we had this, then we could apply modus ponens to get this. Well, uh, by using material implication, we can actually, these are equivalent, All right? Uh, again, I'll do it um, the precise way by adding the, the negation in front of uh, the left-hand side, but for the exam, I won't, I won't say that that's strictly necessary. So in any case, this is just material implication again. On one, okay, and then we just apply double negation on three. Okay, and then look, now we've got it. N implies P implies T, and N implies P, that's the left-hand side, so we can directly infer T using modus ponens. Um, on two and four. Okay. So I would say again, if you skip this step, um, no. Uh, well, okay. If you went directly to this using material implication on the exam, I would accept that. All right. Good. So actually, I would say that was a fairly easy proof. So there's a good variety of difficulty here, hopefully. I think we started with a bit of a harder one. 
Okay, this one has a star next to it, so that means it's recommended. Like, it's probably a good or interesting proof, hopefully. Okay. B implies M and D implies M. Uh, this one is also, I think, going to be pretty easy. B or D, and we're trying to get to M. Okay, this is so. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to give a false impression like oh, this is so easy. If you don't get this, you know, uh, you should feel bad or something. This uses advanced rules. This uses you know some some of the rules that we encountered later on in the section, but. If you know those rules, this should be a very straightforward proof. All right, so how does it go? So again, these are premises. Now, uh, we're going to use this special rule called constructive dilemma. Sorry, let me go over here. Constructive. Uh, constructive dilemma. Remember this rule, which tells you that if you have basically a disjunction like this, and then two conditionals, where like, you know, one conditional starts from the left hand side and the other conditional starts on the right hand side, then you get to infer the disjunction of the consequence. As I said in class, I like to think of it like, okay, um, I don't know whether, like, think of it like you're um, uh, taking a journey, you know, there's a path, like, and you're, you don't know whether you're starting at P or you're starting at R, but you know that if you start at P, then you're going to end up at Q, whereas if you start at R, the path is going to take you to S. So I don't know if I'm at P or at R, the map isn't telling me that, but... Um, I do know that either way, I'm either going to end up at Q or S. So um, that's kind of the way I tried to uh, illustrate this rule metaphorically in class for those who recall or for those who don't. So let's return to the proof. So I mentioned you could either simplify this, but this is perfectly fine. I won't, I won't require you to do that. Um, you can go directly from these two statements uh, to apply constructive dilemma. So constructive dilemma tells you start with the left hand side that takes me to M then I go the right hand side that takes me to M so if I start so either I start at B or I start at D and I'm going to end up either at M or at M um, okay, that's a little bit redundant, but it's important to note, you have to do this step. Okay, you can't just say, so, okay, the rule is going to be constructive dilemma. But you have to do this M or M step. You can't directly do this. Even though, you know, it's obvious that both sides are going to M, the rule tells you that you can take a disjunction and two conditionals and form a new disjunction. So it has to be a disjunction. Then all we have to do is get to M, and that's quite easy because there's this rule, this kind of weird, usually uncommon rule uh, called tautology. Sorry, I've been forgetting to notate this. Constructive dilemma one and two. The rule of tautology, which, again, uh, just a warning. Usually when you have a disjunction, you can't just take one side and eliminate it and call it a day. But there's a special case, which is where you have a disjunction where both sides are the same. In which case, that's not really, it's not like a dis, it's kind of a fake disjunction, right? Either M or M. Okay, well, so that means that M is the case, obviously. So we call that tautology, and you derive that from three, and that's the goal of this proof to get to M. So was this a hard proof or an easy proof? I don't know. 
I would say this was like medium easy because it's extremely short. It uses constructive dilemma, which is a pretty difficult rule, which is why I'm saying it's maybe slightly more advanced. But if you know constructive dilemma, this should have been hopefully very straightforward. And if not, then just go ahead and review the rule. Um, and hopefully that will help. Okay, finally, proof five. First premise says Q implies F implies A. Oh boy, second premise says R implies A implies F. And then the third premise says Q and R. All right, so we've got some crazy double conditionals here. And then we've got this conjunction. We notice that Q is matching Q and R is matching R. And look at what, okay, so before we start just doing stuff, because obviously there's some things that we could obviously do, like start simplifying this, let's actually look at what the goal is. The goal is F if and only if A. So in order to prove F if and only if A, how can we prove a biconditional? Well, there's only one way to do it, and it's going to be material uh, biconditional. Right, which is where you have either F implies A and A implies f well okay if i have that then i'm done so if i have this if i had f implies a and a implies f then i can use material by conditional or material equivalence i think we call it what do we call it let me just check uh material equivalence yeah okay material equivalence so if I had F implies A and A implies F, then I can apply material equivalence to get if and only if A. Remember, that kind of makes sense because here we've got the arrow pointing from F to A, and here we got the arrow from pointing from A to F, and here the arrow sort of points in both directions. So let's do it. So first thing to do um, is the most natural thing to do would be to apply simplification. So these are premises. Right. So first we apply simplification to three, then we apply simplification to uh, three, and now we've got independently asserted the antecedent for these conditionals, right? So we can apply modus ponens because we got Q, so we can do Q implies F implies A. So I can infer F implies A. Um, and that's going to be modus ponens 1, 4. And then I can do A implies F, and that's going to be modus ponens 2, 5, right? R implies A implies F. R, line 5, M plus F. Okay. Um, so let's just make a conjunction out of those. F implies A and M plus F. And then that is a biconditional. So we just do F, sorry, uh, I think I mentioned in class, but I may have forgotten to note that the, the sort of triple bar, the triple equals or the hamburger symbol is uh, our biconditional. So 
Um, so there we go. So we've proven f if and only if a, and the rule is material equivalence on line eight, and we're done. So yeah, that was not ne not an easy proof. I don't know if it's super hard or medium or whatever, but you know that certainly wasn't a super easy proof. Um, so okay, well I'm gonna stop there. Uh, I hope that was helpful. If I have time, I'll try to post another one. Um, but otherwise, um, as I said, review whatever you feel you are least comfortable with. Maybe, you know, like De Morgan's rule. Okay, I don't really get it. I don't, I don't understand it too much. You know, I've written in the textbook our interpretation of De Morgan's rule and our way of presenting it, but here's a different way of presenting it. And this might be more intuitive to you or you might find easier. So just use this as a resource to study um, if you need it. And um, otherwise, uh, good luck on the exam. And I will see you there. Um, okay.